All right, welcome everybody to the 120th episode of Silicon Zombies, where you get the best brains in the Bay to Beyond. We're thrilled to bring all sorts of uh, entrepreneurs and brilliant minds to the space. Today, we're going to be uh, discussing a little bit about rational supercharged drug discovery. I stole that from Tari just because it's so good. <laughs> so we've got Tari, we've got uh, Manuel Lerner, we've got Stacy and Lisa, and a little bit about the sponsors for today. We heard a, uh, we heard about from Nixon Peabody. We also want to thank uh, the folks at Premier Negocios who help us out with our digital marketing. And when it comes to building digital products, web or mobile, uh, Nicodex are the folks to talk to. So more notes will be available on that, but. Just really excited to have everybody here on JP Morgan Week. So as we get things kicked off, we're gonna do some quick introductions on the lovely panelists here. And so first and foremost, we've got Tari, who's a PhD. She's, she has, uh, she's a director for, uh, for search and evaluation for Western US and Canada for Novo Nordisk. So her PhD, PhD is in cell biology from Rockefeller University, extensive licensing, training, and building and managing strategic relationships and scaling those, uh, specifically with Rockefeller University and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer, University, uh, Cancering Center. We also have Dr. Manuel Lerner, scientist and biotech entrepreneur with a proven track record in envisioning and establishing biotech startups. Uh, he's a co-inventor and founder of Pepticom. We're gonna learn a little bit more about them. Uh, it's a disruptive company in the field of AI-based peptide drug discovery. Um, he also has his PhD in biochemistry and did some postdoc research at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and, and published some uh, different wonderful papers um, around blood and nature communications. Uh, and Stacy, uh, she's got her PhD as well. She's, a, she's the vice chair of the AAIH. Um, and she had 13 years at, Gla at GlaxoSmithKline and uh, is a, a, a whiz in AI and machine learning, which is being leveraged to do a lot of this uh, drug discovery. Um, she's also led groups in R&D and business development and uh, alliance management strategy and operations as well. And then lastly, we've got Lisa, who helped us pull tonight off. Um, Lisa is a highly sought after individual in the field of correlating well-being in tech and the economy. So her work has helped governments, institutions, and organizations improve and implement their understanding around circular economies. So just thrilled to have this wonderful folk, uh, group of folks here tonight. And let's just, let's get things kicked off here. Uh, how uh, is AI and machine learning having an impact in, uh, in drug discovery? Uh, do you want to yeah, maybe start us I'll, here? I'll definitely kick off because I am not the whiz in AIML. <laughs> I have zero training in any of that, but I think it's one of those things where if you're going to work for a pharmaceutical company that wants to generate novel, um, safe, and efficacious assets, um, AIML is here to stay. Computational methods to help accelerate um, and, and de risk uh, for discovering the xenothos therapeutics at Novo Nordisk. Um, and like many of our farmer counterparts, uh, we have made some bets and we are not done um, in terms of partnering with companies that have novel uh, AIML based platforms for target discovery as well as drug design and drug discovery. And so if you have been keeping track um, of our deal making over the last 12 months, you'll see some evidence of that. And if you haven't been tracking our deal making, you must be living under a rock <laughs> if you're in the, in the biopharma space. If you're not, that's okay too. But, um, but we're not the only ones, right? I mean, I don't think there's a week that goes by when a pharmaceutical company isn't announcing some sort of partnership or deal making uh, to try to, again, accelerate their efforts. Uh, we have a lot of patients that need treatments and many different diseases. So it's important and it's here to stay. Very cool. Thank you so much. Emmanuel, please. Yeah, so I completely agree. I would just add that, you know, basically time, cost, and risk, but I would add to it, I think, um, new modalities and that uh, explore, can explore uh, larger chemical spaces uh, in a more efficient way with AI for the uh, technologies. That. That's one thing. And uh, I think that also maybe more... Uh, just better drugs, more specific drugs, and so I think that could be also added to the list. Very good. Stacy? 
Yeah, so to build on what you guys have already uh, articulated, I think, you know, I see AI and ML being applied to biology, and that's like the target discovery space. It's being applied to molecule design, whether that's uh, small molecules or peptides or other modalities. Um, and then I think at the end of, of, of the, the value chain here is bringing it to patients and, uh, and making sure that everything that we've designed is going to translate not only to the clinic, but to the broader populations. And I see AI and machine learning being applied all along that value chain. And looking forward to talking about it more tonight. Wonderful. Please, please. Um, it, it was all very beautifully said. I don't know what else I can add, but when you mentioned Stacy about patients, it, it made me think, um, how many of you show of hands took a plane to get here? <laughs> or took a plane traveling, or in the last, <laughs> let's say five years, because we the last <laughs> three years <laughs> traveled and we know why. Um, what you're seeing nowadays is an iris scan or a fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, this was novel. This was from a sci-fi movie. These days, it's completely normal. Um, when I came back through customs, I didn't even understand my eye was being my iris was being scanned when I passed through customs. I said, "What? What? What actually just happened?" Right? It's at this level. And when you talk about pati patients, this this is the next level. This is what's happening. So, machine learning, AI, you know, sequencing of of different behavior. What's going to happen in the future, which is very interesting, and I'll leave it at that, but there's going to be personalized medicine. And for personalized medicine, they're going to be using all of your psych, psych information, all of your social biopsych information, and it's going to happen in these ways. And without machine learning, without you know data science, we can't have that level of acceleration. And so what's also going to happen is that as this is happening in a, in a car, when you're in the, when you're in the airport, when you're just accessing any app, you know, putting your fingerprint, showing your face, what also is going to happen is that you're going to be giving some of your data, which is immediately going to go to pharmaceutical companies that give you a customized and personalized response to as far as what you need that week or that month based on your, your information, your graphics, and that feeds back in to the pharmaceutical companies that know what demands they have, how many people need what, where people are at, so they know, you know, the side of production as well. So that's another another side that isn't as often it, talked about. It's, it's interesting to look into the future and see what's coming next, but it's also helpful to have a little bit of a background. So, um, Stacey, where, how did we do drug discovery before these, these large language models and generative AI? Sure. Um, so you started off actually talking about rational drug design. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take it back even further. There used to be phenotypic screening where like compounds got screened and you looked for a phenotypic response and we weren't sure what they were doing, but those somehow made them forward into medicines. Then, uh, then came about rational drug design where targets were identified molecules back in the day it was always small molecules uh were were designed to fit pockets binding pockets of uh of those um targets actually i mean the, typically even before understanding the binding pocket there was high throughput screening so companies pharma companies in the 90s invested you know, millions, billions of dollars in high throughput screening automation in building out uh, proprietary uh, chemical libraries that would enable hit finding. And all of it was very manual and laborious and a lot of uh, trial and error. And um, through all of that process, though, a lot of data has been generated on on those targets, on those small molecules, and uh, and then broadly how all of those targets connect into different pathways. And I think that 
as humans, we've started to, you know, I mean, PhDs and, uh, and MD PhDs have, have connected together all of the systems biology, but I think there's a limitation to what humans can actually understand. And this is where, where the leap forward in computational sciences, computational biology, as I was talking to uh, someone about tonight earlier, um, is what we called AI before it was AI and rebranded. But um, there, there's a lot of understanding now that we can glean from, uh, from genomics and transcriptomics and understanding of biology. And then there's a lot of acceleration that we can layer on top of that with designing molecules that have all the right properties. Not only that they hit the right target, but they've got the right bioavailability and they've got the right safety profile and they don't hit other targets in the body. And it's all of that multi-parameter optimization that machine learning, I think, is really uh, well suited to tackle. So instead of the, the human-led trial and error, I think what machine learning is helping us to do now is um, is streamline that process so that we've got better understanding of biology to start with and then accelerated molecule design that we can layer on top of that. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, Emmanuel, maybe help us set the table. What, what is a peptide for everybody that doesn't know? So a peptide, the most important thing you need to know about a peptide is a small protein it's, and it's a string. Basically, a natural peptide is 20 amino acids that are encoded in our DNA. And what we are trying to do in Pepticon, in this regard, we are playing with 600 different building blocks. So we have a lot of more chemical space to actually cover, and we can play with uh, different uh, attributes, chemical attributes that make these uh, molecules interesting, more interesting as far as drug-like properties. One, I think, very important uh, aspect here, and I just as a, a continuation, um, is that basically um, what you can do with peptide chemistry is actually synthesize almost any molecule that you like. The small molecules, the chemical space is out there, but in many cases you have uh, chemistries that are very easy to synthesize and chemistries that are extremely difficult to synthesize. With peptides, you more or less know where you are, so you can actually cover a, a huge chemical space very effectively. That's one of the reasons we went uh, for these peptide chemistry. But what we do is basically, you can call it advanced peptidomimetics because of the, you know, of the difference in the building blocks. Just uh, one more uh, thing about the, you know, the general picture. Uh, with peptides, it was basically impossible to do real innovative uh, discovery till the 90s. Before that, you didn't have display technologies that could help you screen. So most of the drugs, the peptide drugs that we see in the market are basically uh, variations on natural peptides uh, in our biology. But now we're starting to see actually the benefits of these uh, new um, uh, methods of screening, basically libraries. Uh, and I think that in the future, we will see even more because we can actually, with computational methods, screen the whole potential or uh, at least try to tap into uh, the potential of the peptide chemistry. So I think it's very exciting. Gotcha, gotcha. So, Tari, yeah, you must see all sorts of really fascinating companies that are moving the needle, you know, pushing the envelope in in, uh, in in the cutting edge of innovation. What are some of the challenges from getting those breakthroughs that are happening into where we can actually take these take these drugs and improve our our general health? So, especially in this space, right? So there's there's so much activity of, you know, in, in the industry where um, with companies that have what, you know, what they call their platforms, their, propri their own proprietary way of, you know, be it algorithm, software, suites and whatnot, in order to be able to do the design and the discovery, to do, to basically shortcut, you know, all, all of the time intensive and labor intensive efforts, 
But here's a dirty little secret. We still got to do the wet stuff, <laughs> right? It just means instead of dealing with 50,000 options, maybe we can narrow it down to 50, which is, yes. a, which is significant. So, but what I am seeing is there's those companies that are like, they're just all about the platform. And like, we will partner with, with anybody and make the as, any asset of your dreams. Great, right? But we all know that focus is everything. So, you know, so there are those companies that actually are building their own therapeutics pipeline and essentially putting their platform to work, validating it. And then from, that, from there, they build their own track record as in like, see, I can make this. Another very little secret. Does it work in the clinic? Is it safe? Does it work? Yes, we've managed to accelerate the time of the discovery of the wet stuff but it's not until it goes in an, an, into animals. It's not until it goes into humans. And we're not really quite there yet. I think we're, we're close. Um, we are, we've been talking to a lot of companies where our goal is to be able to get that chemical matter, and it could be peptides, it could be antibodies, it could be <coughs> small molecules. But, and we are trying to essentially build in the de-risking using their methodology and their technology. But in the end, we still have to shoulder the burden of all the testing from the test tube to the animal model and to the humans. And we just, I just had a huge conversation with our clinical development team. And in our space, we are talking large clinical trials and we still haven't figured out. There are companies that claim like we can help de-risk your clinical trials, but you can't make them small because we still have to test a broad population when you're talking about a, a, a disease that affects the general population. There are digital twin technologies that are enabling smaller trials, I think, as well. Um, but most clinical, 90% of clinical trials fail. And the majority of those failures are due to translation. So a molecule may work in a mouse model, but it doesn't work when you put it into a human. Um, I don't know how many oncologists I've heard that have said, like, I've cured mice and I've yet to, like, get a medicine to market in humans. Um, and that translation gap is one of the biggest issues. But I think all of that comes back to, like, have you selected the right target? At the Do you really understand all the pathways in biology? And have you selected the right model then to build all of your data on? And then are you selecting the right patient that that medicine should go so into. So then that goes back to genetics, genomics. When the Human Genome Project was finally not really finished, but pretty close to being done, and we really, you know, I mean, the scientific world has been generating immensely large data sets, and I think that is too where AML kind of found its footing. The ways to deconvolute, how to analyze this data, make it manageable, actually get things that are, you know, in my world we call it actionable. Right, yeah. And we do heavily, I mean, we like to say it's like, you know, we want to work on targets that are validated in human, you know, with, with, with human genetics, right? And so there's entire outfits of like, oh, is this a genetic development? Like, it's literally a checkbox in our, in our due diligence. But it is important, and that because we are trying to mitigate that translational risk. And by translation, I mean, okay, it works in the test tube, it works in the cells, it works in the animal model. But you're right, so many things fall flat once it gets into humans, because we are different. I would add something. Yeah. I think this is a very important uh, input. Uh, when you're talking about small companies, I mean, in the end of the day, what you're talking about here is, you know, it's a huge effort. Doing all of this from discovery to uh, clinical development. So having um, a validated target and working on a vertical project, I think it's, it's a very good idea for small uh, uh, companies that are, you know, they have an interesting technology that they would actually want to bring forward. So, so to the uh, biotech entrepreneurs that are listening, what kind of advice would you give them on how to focus and not try to boil the ocean? Mm -hmm. So that exactly, you know. <laughs> I think that's I mean, what we're all getting at. Yeah. <laughs> million dollar question. Yeah. A validated target would be helpful, at least to start with, to begin with. You have to have a good a business idea, you know, understanding of the market. Otherwise, there are many validated targets that there is no reason to work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, having a, a vertical uh, project, you can, you know, try to mix it with, you know, 
some kind of uh, other activities. Uh, but these are two things that I think are really helpful and uh, could be the difference between success and failure of the company. I think the companies that's the the early AI ML startups that are now the most uh, advanced all started in in a single with a single focus area. They started with just the biology understanding, or they started with just the chemistry. And as they grew, as their programs advanced, is when they built out additional capabilities, or are still building out those capabilities. Um, so I think you you've got to pick a lane and and stick with it as well. Wise words. Um, and are you able to create a model that uh, is a replica of a human so the FDA will be more likely or maybe is that just kind of a losing battle? Yeah, I'm thinking about digital twins, uh, digital twin technologies that are built in that way. There are FDA approved models for that as well. It's, it's all you know, clinical trial specific, drug specific, disease specific. Um, and you need enough data for that as well, but that can help then reduce, you know, the the number of patients you need to enroll in a control arm, for instance. Uh, as, a, as a biologist, I would say that there are so many things we don't understand in biology, like glycobiology, uh, you know, so, you know, in its infancy, and there are so many things that you cannot predict. I would, I think, so that one thing is trying to a model biology in, in a perfect way. I think we are not there yet. The other way is trying to solve very specific issues that you know you have in every uh, drug uh, drug uh, project, and that's that's the path we are taking. And I think most companies are going towards this. <coughs> Hopefully, in the future, that will change. I think that would be a great advancement. Uh, advancement, and, it, and it's helping us. Well, using machine learning is helping us reduce the footprint for drug discovery too. You know, it, within the context of circular economies, Lisa, I think that's pretty interesting. You, can you share a little bit about your experience in uh, circular economies and, and how you're able to translate that? Sure. Well, um, if you think about what's making the most impact, right? If you want a circular economy, you want a, a future that's feeding into itself that industries are connected. That's simple enough. And if you look at the topic of this panel, let's say take uh, the area of genomics, a lot of people didn't understand. In a circular, circular economy, one of the most important things is for people to understand you know, what technology is, how technology is being you know, shared, used, utilized. So one of the fields we're talking about here, genomics, let's say, it helped a lot of people understand how technology is helping the world at large in different industries. So a lot of people didn't know the terminology. They didn't know what AI is, what machine learning is, um, what data science is. And a lot of biotech has been using these kind of tools for decades even further right. so I think one of the things that was a positive is that this field helped educate a lot of people on what has been historically already been used and already been a workable tool and protocol right in the world of drug discovery yeah collaboration is huge perhaps one example oh uh, thank you for that hey, collaboration is huge you know uh, speaking of which, uh, Emmanuel, it must have been pretty neat to be able to do some postdoc research uh, with a Nobel laureate. Can, can you help us understand a little bit about your work with Professor Michael Rosbach? So I did my postdoc with, uh, actually with uh, uh, one of his students, but we published together before we got the Nobel Prize. And I think circadian so biology is extremely important or, and, and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I'm very glad I, I had a few years working on this field. I did a few other things during the, you know, my days in the, uh, in the university. So I think a, a broad look, uh, you know, understanding of biology is always uh, a good thing, and very important. It makes you humble and gives you some perspective. Um, yeah. Great, thank you for that. Did you want to add? 
Okay, uh, Tari, what got you interested in this space initially when, when you were when you were younger? Did you did you're always fascinated about science and, and human health? Yes, um, you know, in short, so um, I have the benefit of, of being an only child, raised by two very highly educated parents. My mom was a PhD, granted, in the social sciences, but education was always first on, on her list for me, and she made a lot of sacrifices so I could go to some of the, you know, some really great schools, um, you know, the kind of like no expense was spared, including all the extracurricular activities, so I've become a well-rounded person. Uh, my dad was a physician. Um, I also had the benefit of being able to spend a good amount of my childhood in Washington, D.C., and then getting exposed to all of the art and the culture and the museums. And it turns out that my favorite museum was the Museum of Natural History. Mm. So I was just always drawn to that. And um, I mean, now I'm a bit more diverse, but I would always like, I want to see you know, the animals and so forth. And then I stumbled, I think, in my early teens, you know, finding books about like, biology, genetics. I'm not going to set my age but you know, things were still a little new but I, I remember finding you know this it was basically like a graphic novel like a comic book talking about genetics and dna and that was sort of the beginning of how i found my focus and found the, like this is the path that i want to go so you know i majored in i always took you know biology and chemistry classes in high school and you know continued on that path through undergrad went to grad school in you know in the life sciences um, but, you know, it's very funny because when you talked about collaborations, one of the things I realized at, while I was doing my PhD was how much I did not like being isolated and working alone and in academic science. Then that was very much the way, right? And then it's like you go by, by yourself two o'clock in the morning, toiling, right, and generating results and will turn to great papers and so on. And I'm like, I don't really like this isolation stuff. Right. Like I want people to talk to exchange ideas. So I toughed it out, I finished, I'm very grateful that I did, but I never did a postdoc because I went straight into what's called academic tech transfer, so commercializing innovations out of the academic laboratories by partnering with companies. This is a Rockefeller? Uh, so my PhD was at Rockefeller, yeah. um, and then that's when I went to Sloan Kettering. Okay. Was, that was my, 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 my two-year boot camp in oncology. <laughs> but again, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today was not really prevalent, but I, I saw the high throughput screening, the first robots, right, for you know, for, you know, for, you know, for all the pipettes and the 48 wells and the 96 wells and whatnot. So I remember that brute force. Remember like how long it would take to like get a crystal structure? So when you spend time in the lab, you understand how hard it is. So when things, when advances like this happen and you're like, wow, I mean, now people can do high throughput crystal structure creation. Oh, can we pause for a second? Yeah. High throughput crystal what now? Okay, so when we're talking about, for instance, a target, right, yeah. which is usually a protein, proteins aren't just these amorphous blobs. They have what, what we call structure. But the only, but one of the ways that we, one of the few ways we could actually see its structure, because they're complex, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, can't, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details, was actually by crystallizing it under very specific conditions. And you would have to experiment what those conditions were. Many, I mean, many of our classes were like, my crystals did not crystallize. <laughs> They're just little drops of liquid. Right. Because then once you form the crystal, then you can pass x-rays through it, and then you get the picture. That's how the structure of DNA, for uh, instance, was gotcha. elucidated, right? It was that we call that x-ray diffraction. So, it used to be you would do one protein at a time, but you would, you would, you would do multiple efforts, right? Um, now you can do multiple proteins all at, at one time, and that too has sped things up. Um, but then once you have that structure, I think this is what Stacy was getting to at the beginning of the conversation, then you get to see all of the subtleties, and that's where you find these pockets, these, these specific sites where you could potentially, you know what, if I put a chemical compound here or a peptide here, an antibody here, I could change the activity of this protein. I, I, I kind of just assumed it was like pressure and cold, where I guess it's actually interacting with other chemicals as well. Correct. Okay. Yes. Maybe just to add. Please. And We're all going to geek out yeah. now. I could yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is yeah. the good stuff. Trying to, not, not to be too, too scientific, but when I started the, my, my bachelor's, actually, you would still look for papers in the library. Yeah. Oh, yes. And uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a, a huge change. Uh, structural biology 
orders of magnitude more advanced uh, sequencing. I mean, biology today, uh, AI uh, is, is just is completely different than what it was uh, 20 years ago. It's, it's a completely different science, basically. I mean, the way it's actually done, it's, it's fascinating. I think the power of biology today is, is really it's outstanding and it's getting better and better. And it's also interconnecting with uh, basically with computer science. And I think these are very exciting times. I wanted to build on what Tari was saying as well, because there's X-ray crystal structures, which give you how you can modify a protein, which then modifies some biological action. But then came cryo-EM, which yes. was like an even bigger technology breakthrough, because that allowed us to get the structures faster and differently. Can we unpack and that for a second, what cryo-EM is? Let me... Let me actually just get past cryo-EM because what I wanted to get to was AlphaFold. Um, and uh, AlphaFold is now the technology that we use. Every, every crystal structure of every protein in the human body, in every model system, is predicted based, by, based on AlphaFold. So this is a machine learning technology that, I mean, basically takes what is known about physics and, and structures, but, uh, but you can go into a database now and it's all known. So that's been a complete leapfrog in the last few years using machine learning and AI to now understand what the structures are. You don't need to, to know whether your compound crystallizes now because you can computationally predict with very high accuracy the structure and the binding pocket. Do you agree? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a great leap forward. Yeah. Still has a few challenges to, to solve. But I think it's, it's great for, for society <clears throat> and for science. I mean, but I, it's, it's not, I think there are still some challenges there. What, what are some other challenges that, that you see? Uh, I think that some structures or proteins are underrepresented. And then their, their structure is not as accurate as we would expect. But I think that everybody working in the field, you know, understands it. So it's not completely solved, but it's, it's orders of magnitude better than what we had before. So it's a, it's a great, great chip. Sure. What, what are going to be some of the next big uh, unlocks in the next one to two years? And it's okay if uh, we're kind of shooting from the hip and guessing here. I mean, and are we going to talk specifically about therapeutics or? Yes. Okay. Hmm. I'll start. Go for it. I think, <laughs> uh, I think we're not even going to Chemistry is, in terms of AI and ML technologies applied to drug discovery, I see chemistry applications being more advanced. I think generative AI applied to molecule design, we're going to start seeing uh, become routine because we've got enough data to be able to say, look, we need all of these parameters. I need this solubility. I need these PK parameters. I need this safety profile. I need this potency and efficacy. And uh, with broad enough, I think, virtual libraries um, and, and, you know, generative models now, I think we're going to be seeing faster molecule design. The bottleneck is still then going to be experimentally synthesizing and testing those, um, but I think it's going to reduce that space. Um, the other thing I think that we'll see in the next few years as well is, um, is like generative biology and uh, using large language models or even large multi multimodal models now to uh, apply to biology and, uh, and helping to connect all of that uh, so that we've got more confidence in not only target discovery, but the translation potential into impacting human disease. When you say multimodal, what does that look like practically? Um... Because we got video, we've got text, we've got voice, but in the in the in the lab, what, is, what does that look like? I think it can look like a number of. I mean, I was describing more the chemistry side of things, but in the biology side, you know, you've got your genomics, you've got your transcriptomics, you've got your proteomics, 
Um, all of that data is coming together to give you a better understanding of underlying biology. You add in clinical phenotypes on top of that. You add in um, additional real world data from human patient populations. And I think that that starts giving you a better understanding of all of the different, uh, different ways disease can manifest and, uh, and progress. I see. And, and along the lines, can you tell us a little bit about the role of AIH in, in modern healthcare and what the goals are? Yeah, so um, I'm here representing the Alliance for AI in Healthcare. We are a pre-competitive consortia of, uh, of healthcare companies, uh, academic institutes, other nonprofits, and are bringing together players in this space, thought leaders in this AI space, so that we can join as one voice in influencing regulatory and data uh, practices and, uh, and together hopefully influence if, if AI in healthcare is going to be regulated, being able to have a voice at the table that says this is how we think it should be regulated. Um, uh, these, are, these are the considerations that we have in place for data sharing, data privacy, and, uh, and models that use all of that data. Very good. Uh, also, shout out to Dr. Sarah Banton, who helped us coordinate for this evening. So thank you so much, Sarah. I'll pass this to the audience in a little bit. So if you have questions uh, for the panel here, let's do that. But, but first and foremost, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, are the, what are the current business models, sorry, for uh, for drug discovery licensing deals, and, and how does how does that work? And you're talking like specifically in terms of well building relationships and partnerships. So, what one of the things that I truly appreciate about working for a company like Novo Nordisk is that first and foremost, we are truly. I mean, they say it, but we do follow through, and it's like we are flexible on on the structure of our relationships. It has to be mutually beneficial i mean if, yeah if you look at the news it's like it kind of looks like we're just acquiring sometimes entire companies sometimes entire assets but underneath all of that we have a lot of collaboration collaboration with academia collaborations with small biotechs um and and so and that requires flexibility right what everybody has different needs so we can't say this is the way we do it and this is the only way we do it Right. If you know, I I would have a hard time for companies like all we're going to do is just do acquisition. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not everybody wants to get acquired, and then that's the end of the conversation. Sure. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build relationships so that the conversation continues and actually builds and grows. And a lot of what we want to do is we want to test together, like, hey, let's let's try your technology out, let's try your platform out, and see if it will work in our diseases of interest. And if we're successful, awesome, we'll keep going together. And if we're not, we're gonna shake hands and say, have a great day. Sure. Right? But, un but to test it in, in, in a way that is relatively unbiased and you know, um, that's important too. So we love what we call feasibility studies or pilot studies. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone's, especially in markets like today, right? Often strategic partners are seen as a great way to be able to extend runway. Um, I'm doing another talk tomorrow morning talking exactly about that. But you have to treat the other party exactly like that. Ask a partner, not just a target, right? Not just not someone that you're gonna, you know, kick around, right? You have to come together and work together and understand that we each bring something to the table. And that is often the conversation we have. It's like, what can we you know, what can we bring to the table other than money? Everybody loves money, right? Is there more? <laughs> Right? And the answer to that is like often we do. So that's that's the core of, 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 of that conversation. Well, you're doing something right because the stock looks like a hockey stick. <laughs> keep, keep doing that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, please. Ask a question. Go ahead. So, first of all, thank you very much and everybody who uh, has joined us tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone here. Um, I'm uh, very proud to be on the board of the AIH and also the advisory board of Pepticom, being, uh, working closely with uh, the team in the last three years. I wanted to ask a question, uh, Emmanuel, uh, since you mentioned peptidomimetics, and uh, I wanted maybe uh, you could elaborate a little bit more about what is the promise of the peptidomimetics for the world? 
and how is it going to be the next generation of therapeutics? Thank so you. maybe I, I'll just keep on like from what Stacy said before about the generative chemistry, which I think is was a very good insight on the future. And I think that because when you look at drugs today, I mean, if you look at small molecules, for example, you'll see that they are basically, you see the, like the uh, different families of molecules. So you see very, very similar uh, chemistry within a family, within a target, and then you move to another target and then you see the resemblance, right? And when you try to use some of the, uh, the computational technologies, you see that you, you get something interesting, but it would be quite similar to something that is probably already known. So a variation of something. You know. So I think that the future would be very exciting when we'll have completely novel chemistry coming out uh, of these uh, generative models of chemistry. So that's one thing. And in this relates to, to the question of uh, South is that I think that peptidometrics can enable this because if you have the right engine, let's say, of uh, peptidome use uh, reinforcement learning uh, technology, and uh, you can actually bring this to reality because you can envision, you can design an interesting chemistry within in silico and then translate it to real chemistry. And it's not that trivial to do with other chemistries. I mean, it depends on the chemistry. So that's one thing. The other things are, I just think that, uh, you know, if you use uh, what we call it the advanced kinematics, the drug properties are interesting as well. So it's, I think, uh, it could be, you know, an interesting uh, modality for the near future. With the goal of increasing standard of care for everybody. Uh, where do you see that happening in the next, uh, I guess now and in the next couple of years? Standard. Yeah. So what we are we are in drug, drug discovery. So sure. Our early stage. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not going to impact the sure. patients in the next two years, but maybe sure the other members here. Uh, well, I mean, standard of care basically means these are these are the therapies of today as well as for quote unquote yesterday that are that are in the market being prescribed by by physicians often for first line second in line right so to go beyond set of care really does bring us into the therapeutics of tomorrow how can we improve from the safety and the efficacy point of view right um but uh, i kind of want to like hand this over to lisa because i know you know in terms of like you know really being able to advocate for you know for better health care for, for patients and um, and a lot of, you know, and here's the thing, right? Research, drug discovery, drug manufacturing, it, you know, in the olden days and maybe still today, it, it can be potentially quite wasteful. And that's why all these failures are there. You know, if you look in the big picture, they're, they're, they're sad wastes and they're not, they're not trivial. But, you know, so. Yeah, and that's a great, great point. Lisa, do you want to kind of kick us off? That's here? exactly right, because you have to think about what is this industry doing that is helping other people and other companies support. So what's happening is that there's all of these other startups, small companies, even big pharma starting different uh, sections of their company to create different products to support this pipeline and then this sales uh, pipeline as well. One example, um, when Stacy was talking about what's happening in the lab, Right, what's happening in the lab. There's all these other companies that are creating robots, <coughs> androids, um, organs, so the test trials can be accelerated. There's already companies that have a brain or an organ or a lung that exists and are, we were talking about twin studies, right? They're actually emulating and they're almost carbon copies of what's already in the human body. So what's happening is that it's giving access and it's giving opportunity to all of these other industries. Um, that's very interesting because some of those trials don't work out that well. Some of the trials do work out that well, but it's giving us a chance to test out different things and see what's happening. Um, 
I can go a lot deeper into that. I'll just say one more thing about that. The next phases of that is involving <clears throat> emotions of a person. You know, this is what's setting up the stage for other kinds of experimental phases that involve the brain, you know, an artificial copy of, of a person. So we can help protect you know, what we think is human, who really knows, um, and see what kind of results we have to keep people safer. And when we're, you know, producing pharmaceuticals, that would be the most ideal scenario. Whether it's right or wrong is also a question, which brings up another important reason why to add value and have a lot of worth placed on ethics of technology in general. Should we do, be doing this? Should we not be doing this? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be doing testing with all these different products? That's another another very interesting question. Well, we always want to be valuable to uh, to our guests here. So, um, Tari, help us understand that you know we've got a bunch of really wonderful, brilliant people in the audience as well. How can they help you in your mission at Nova Nordisk? Well, um, you know, so we are a company that is focused on cardiometabolic diseases, which are diseases that affect a, a fairly large population, but we are also very cognizant that there are under, underserved populations, there are populations that are not being addressed. I think one thing that we haven't really talked about much, but also understanding that we need to increase the diversity of the human patients that we that we we do put into the clinical trials when we when we run them is extremely important and one of the things that we are very instant for instance is being able to look at um, cohorts, right we have populations from different areas that being said right um in when we say cardiometabolic disease diabetes and obesity are are very high on our priority list yes we're already players in the space um, but we want to continue to be um, a good player in the space. Um, chronic cardiovascular disease like heart failure, atherosclerosis, you know, um, cardiovascular disease is still one of the major um, killers and disease areas that affect, you know, human health today. Um, and then there's other organs that are affected, you know, uh, you know, when you are diabetic, such as your kidneys, your liver, um, so we have activity in kidney and liver disease. But we've also had a long-standing historical business in rare diseases, and particularly rare blood disease and rare growth disorders. And I'm sharing this with you because, one, we are Novo Nordisk. We are not the other NOV that has more diverse activities like oncology and infectious disease. The way that you can help me is to really be very effective in how you communicate who you are, who your company is, why are you special, why are you different, why are you better, and why, and why we together could be a, a really strong partnership, right? Um, that's, that's extremely useful. Um, and Sarah knows this, is that I'm extremely direct when I give feedback. Um, so, and it, it, but it's a conversation, right? It takes and I'll, I'll to always, <laughs> <laughs> I will always take the first conversation, but to get the second one, you, 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 you have to leave a good impression. Yeah, wise, wise words, be succinct. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so speaking of it, oh yeah, we have some questions, no? Okay. Oh yeah, and more questions from the audience, please, if somebody wants to, yeah, Tim, go ahead. Uh, so my question is with, you know, er earlier there were some discussions about using, here you go. Earlier there were some conversations about using mouse or mice to um, you know, help build on uh, the research that's already been done in the laboratory. And there's been a lot of talks about using AI to build a digital human model that looks just like the human, right? That has enough similarities where we no longer need the mouse, right? To, you know, the potential to eliminate failures when it comes to uh, testing of mice, which may have you know, some differences from humans. Where do you think we are um, on this stage to being able to use digital human models to be able to test you know, some of these latest inventions that are coming out from the laboratory? Great question. You brought this up today. Yeah. So <laughs> animal testing is no longer a requirement of the FDA, right? Uh, this is relatively new. What isn't going to replace it though is digital only models. We will always need some lab validation, at least, I mean, not always, I shouldn't say always, 
in the next, you know, <laughs> five years, we will need experimental validation. You will need an in vitro assay. You will, maybe you won't need an in vivo assay, but you might need, you know, an organoid or something like that. I think we are still a long ways off from something uh, that uh, that is solely in silico going forward. Um, the, there's a lot of other testing that still needs to happen. And remember, animal testing was never 100% a success to start with. So, who's to say that some other, you know, virtual rendition will also be, you know, 100% successful? Even though it's not FDA required, I will say that pharma partners and VCs are still looking for that animal validation, though. So it still is a check mark on a lot of uh, on a lot of people's checklists. So I don't see it going away necessarily. Um, even though it's it, most clinical trials fail, even though they've succeeded in an animal models, right? So that tells you that there's a, a failure of translation there somewhere along the line. I completely agree. I just would add that the day when you have a computational model that he is actually making these animal studies uh, you know, not worse than why. We'll, first of all, we'll all know about it, and it will be a great uh, you know, transition in medicine in love. We're not there yet. Great. Pius, we've got another question here. Sure. Um, Thank you so much, opportunity. Uh, great panel, by the way. Uh, my question is, with the use of AIML, if you are going to be making progress and making the cost of drug discovery uh, 10 times lower, 100 times lower, what's your prediction in uh, 2025 and beyond? I'll kick this off. When there was a Nature Reviews drug discovery article, I think, uh, published last year that calculated the average cost of a new medicine at six billion dollars. That's the cost to develop, <coughs> discover and develop a new drug that makes it to patients. That cost includes all of the failures along the way, all of the attrition, right? So um, I don't have, I think it's going to start coming down. Um, we're seeing, of course, more emphasis on rare disease where there's a genetic driver and we know there's going to be higher probability of clinical success. Um, but I think AI and ML are going to help reduce the failures that we are seeing um, on, on the biology side, on the speed to failure because we're more fat, we're faster at, at designing molecules. So I don't have a, a hard number prediction, but I, it's I, coming I, down from six billion. I, I think they just had a breakthrough for sickle cell anemia, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, great. So another question here, please. I'm pretty loud. It's okay. Um, I want to go back to the drug design. So we have small molecules on one end. We have biologics on the other end. Uh, white peptides, do they have any special advantage in terms of uh, the interface with uh, AI and machine learning? Thank you for the question. Uh, you planted yeah. it. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> even, uh, <laughs> even, though, <laughs> even though we know each other, it's, uh, it wasn't a free spot. Yes, so exactly. So it's in between small molecules and, and antibodies, and I think that the interesting thing about uh, peptides and peptidomimetics is First of all, the ability to, to do like real protein-protein interaction inhibition, which is something that antibodies do, uh, and small molecules very rarely are able to do in most cases. It's an allosteric effect, not a, a real protein-protein interaction inhibition, but there are some cases, but in general, that's not uh, your chemistry of choice. And uh, this is paired with the general uh, uh, this theoretical um, and also uh, shown test cases of all availability or bioavailability. So try to think about something that acts like an antibody but is already available. So that opens up a lot of interesting uh, niches as far as uh, potential drugs. I would just add to the 
what was uh, mentioned before uh, about uh, drug discovery and the cost. So I think this should be also normalized to, 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 the, to the projects. I mean, the drugs that are being developed today, in some cases are extremely challenging as far as the, the biology. And, and so that I think should be taken into account as well. And uh, when you're looking at AI and the potential, I will just, I mean, I think an interesting idea was, will be to think about the day where the, the AI would be so effective that it would actually completely transform the way that we discover drugs. So we are not there yet, but think about if you had really a way of seriously de-risking uh, uh, development, uh, clinical development of a molecule and a discovery phase, you actually have tremendous uh, uh, ability to, to impact the market. It's, uh, I think it will completely change the dynamics of how a drug is, is brought to market, probably change the, the market itself. I think that's an interesting issue to think about. With what we see with alpha fold, sorry, I'm interjecting, okay. just relating to what she said about alpha fold. So, isn't this already there with this technology that you are the next step would be to bring the cost down using alpha fold? So, alpha fold, I think it's is extremely important, but it's it's one factor within thousands of factors. It's a very important factor, but the more and more let's say alpha folds of different, of different aspects you, you will have, that, then you see the impact. We're not, not there yet, but it's a very positive step in the right way. Which means there's opportunity for entrepreneurs to get in still. Sure. I think it's so a very exciting times for, for biotech and and, sure. and and how can the Silicon Zombies community help what you're building at Pepticom? Pepticom? And... Check out the website, maybe. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're trying to, I mean, we're a small company. Uh, what we're trying to do is to actually show that, uh, and I think we are showing it, to generate completely not in innovative uh, chemistry around, uh, in our case, uh, a de-risked uh, target, because we, we wanted to de-risk this factor at least. And uh, so, that's very exciting for us because when, as a scientist, when you see like completely novel chemistry actually working, that's not a trivial thing. And the next step is solving other uh, you know, challenges like bioavailability and, and others. And I think we are a very good plan for that. Excellent. Excellent. And Stacy, Lisa, how can the community help what you're both building respectively? Yeah, I would say at the AIH, we are uh, always looking for new members and engagements. <laughs> um, <laughs> so reach out if uh, if you're interested in joining our community. We're promoting responsible AI. We're writing white papers on uh, regulatory and uh, and data science and the communal use of AI for healthcare. Uh, I'm really excited with what Stacy shared because I've talked to some of the people at AIH and their team, and there's many different ways we can write and publish. So I look forward to being involved with this. And we're in talks about that. Um, look at look at the links. Look at everything that we do. Reach out to us. Ask us questions. We're all very open and approachable. Any ideas you have, however we can help you, is what helps me. And um, another thing that I would say is remember that we're all, you know, in this world of AI, but we're all people as well. So I think the more we develop our mind, our body, this thing called human capital development, the better we can be of service to the technology we're building and the better that that technology will actually have more beneficial impact on the world, which is a little bit more in harmony. So you can say, don't think about that, but I was asked and I think that's a really good thing 
that you could all help me with. Just remember that. Can I make one comment to sort of um, build on that? So we can get really lost into the science, the excitement of the technology, right? I mean, your efforts, your efforts, my company's efforts. But when you actually spend time with the patient, and that's where the people equate it, it, it is eye-opening, if not life-changing. So those of you who are entrepreneurs, I know these are tough times. You're trying to be super focused. You're trying to fundraise. You're trying to partner. You're trying to advance your technology. But keep in mind that hopefully what you're doing is more than just a scientific passion, right? Is that, especially if we're talking about therapeutics, you are actually trying to help a real human being, a group of human beings, a large group of human beings. Spend some time with some patients. It's not always the easiest thing to sit, but it's extremely valuable. One of the things that's really important is the patient's experience, right? The diseases that we handle are chronic, they are lifelong. So how can you make that experience? I mean, when you get your diagnosis, it's pretty devastating, especially if you're a kid. So how can we develop treatments, not just faster and better, but also to make sure that when they take that treatment, it doesn't disrupt their entire life. And there's so many examples of that. And if you think you have a technology that can create a better patient experience, mm -hmm. go for it. But paint that picture that way too. Don't just get, it's very easy to get into the weeds. I mean, I'm a scientist by training. I can totally do that. But until you sit with a type 1 diabetes patient or a cancer patient, if you're an oncology, you need that, that human perspective. So, uh, you know, like we like. Yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, it's a fascinating conversation, but let's give another round of applause for Enjoy the rest of the evening, everybody. Have a wonderful week at JPM. Thank you again, Sarah, for, for, uh, for helping us coordinate. And uh, yeah, check out siliconzombies.com. And thanks, everyone, for showing up. Take care.